Good afternoon. It is September 9th, 2020, and we're here for our midweek Bible study at Travis Baptist Church, 5802 Weber Road, Corpus Christi, Texas. I'm Pastor David Byrne, and we're here with you today. Um... Just to let you know, this coming Sunday, the 13th of September, we are opening up a couple more Sunday school classrooms uh, for adults and the the children. Um, in other words, we currently have been having the teenagers meeting with upstairs, and Dwayne's classroom has been meeting. Um, Rick's class is going to meet in the B wing, the big classroom that faces the playground that we're remodeling. And then Sam's classroom is going to meet in the parlor. Those will both be at 9.30. And Miss Barbara will have the smaller children upstairs in her room. Um, and so uh, that's what we're going to do for now for Sunday school. It's going to run from 9.30 to 10.30 on Sunday mornings. At 10.45 we have our live worship. There will not be a nursery. There will not be children's church. We want families to sit together in the sanctuary and um, uh, we will uh, kind of continue that for a while longer and see what this virus thing does okay keep that as a matter of prayer as we are taking steps forward and trying to get more and more opportunities for you to grow to learn to fellowship we still in these classrooms have to try and keep our distance keep our masks on at least for a little while and um uh, as we grow and learn to study the Bible together. All right, so that is going on, kicking off this weekend. We're going to be continuing our study on the genuine Jesus, the book of Colossians. And if you want to get ready to turn there, we're going to be in chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, talking about how in a world that really tries to pick apart Jesus and make him kind of more and more like us instead of us more and more like him, um, and so uh, today we're going to be dealing a little bit more with, you know, everything, everything that Christ is, is enough for us. Um, just recently, this past week on the internet, maybe at the end of last week, um, a group called Legionnaire Ministries put out what they call a major survey they do every year called the State of Theology. Basically, it's a nationwide survey of... Christians and trying to get their views on basic doctrines of the Bible and how do they feel. You may say, what's the significance of that? Well, when just barely over half, 54%, I believe it was, of evangelical Christians um, believe that Jesus was God, is God. Um, in other words, about 43%, 46%, somewhere in there, um, believe that Jesus is a good teacher is the way the question was stated, but not the Son of God. Now, if you don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, that's really what makes you a Christian. Um, so to believe he's just a teacher, that's a, that, that's a wrong thing. That will not get you through the pearly gates. That will not cleanse you of your sins. That will not put you in a relationship with God. And that's a lot of what Colossians is about. People trying to nail down who Jesus is. A lot of people out there trying to tell you he's not God in the flesh. He might be a spirit, kind of like a supercharged angel or something along that line. Simple fact of the matter is, these things get you into hell, not heaven. And so as we come to Colossians chapter 2, well, th this point has been hammered in chapters 1 and 2. Um, if you want to go back and on our Facebook page, you'll find links to all these messages that we started a few months ago. I think today is the 12th in this series, so um, you can also go to our, uh, the links will be on our Facebook page of Travis Baptist Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, search for that on Facebook. You will find links to our YouTube videos travisbaptist.org slash sermons is our website that will have these on there and um, uh, you can check them out for yourself all right but suffice it to say in chapters one it made it clear man Jesus did all the things that God does he saved us he created us he holds the universe together all the things that only a God could do Jesus does um, and we come down into chapter two and we're going to be ver reading verses eight through ten today Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware, lest anyone 
uh, through philosophy and empty deceit, cheat you according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your words and for reminding us, Lord, that we should not allow anybody to cheat us out of the wonderfulness that you are. We should not allow them to water down who you are. We should not allow them to slander you by degrading you and, and, and telling us that you are not who you said you were. You said you and the Father are one. You mentioned one time, Lord, before the Pharisees that, that you would pray to your Father and they picked up stones to stone you because they clearly understood that by calling God your Father, you were making yourself equal with God. And in fact, you were. It is glorious to know that God himself would come and walk among us, come and die for us, rise to the grave to give us eternal life, that you, Lord, would dwell in us as the Holy Spirit who fills us. And that there, there, there may be people out there today kind of searching for something, wanting some truth in their life, feeling there's an empty spot in them. Help them see the first, the, the, the truth Help them see the truth of verse 10 where it says, For we are complete in Him. That everything we need in life, everything we feel we're lacking, we will find it in You, Jesus. Open their eyes, their minds up today that they might find You. And we say all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. So we come to Colossians chapter 2. And uh, as we get down here to verse 8, you know, he's been talking about, you know, in Christ is all the good things you need. Don't let anyone, verse 8, tell you that Jesus is not enough. Don't let anyone tell you that you need Jesus and fill in the blank. You don't need Jesus and good works. You don't need Jesus and a good life. You don't need Jesus and church membership. You need Jesus Christ as your Savior and that is all. Whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. It's very clear what it teaches. So don't let anyone, verse 8, cheat you. And that's an interesting word he lays because you know he's deceiving you, he's cheating you. This is just like the guy who calls you up or sends you the email that I got $37 million dollars that I need somebody in the United States to hold on for me and I'll give you a good 30% of it if you'll do that. And then when you say yes, then you send him your bank account information and you find out instead of sending you $37 million, he cleans you out all 85 bucks you got left at the end of the month. This is what the devil wants to do, is to cheat you out of peace, out of grace, out of God's favor, he wants to cheat you out of all the blessings that come from being able to walk with Jesus Christ. He wants to cheat you have out of having a good prayer life, out of growing and knowing Him. He wants to cheat you out of the transformation that God wants to work in you. Most of all, cheat you out of that opportunity for eternal life by telling you that's not the way. And even if you are Christian, He still works at cheating you out of all those other blessings. But where? Let anyone cheat you through philosophy, empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, stuff that makes sense on an earthly basis. It really makes more sense that if you do good things, you get good things in return. But so much of life doesn't work that way. And with the gospel, it doesn't matter how many good things you do. You are condemned in the eyes of God if you don't have Jesus Christ. Don't believe me? Look up John chapter 3, about verse 18 in there. John 3, 16, very famous, says, Whosoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. When you get down to verse 18, it says, He that has the Son has eternal life, but he that has not the Son is condemned already, for he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now look. Don't let anyone tell you different because this is what the Word of God tells you. But this is what I was taught. This is what my grandma said, what my parents said, what my priest said, what my 
Sunday school teacher said, does not matter. What does the Word of God say? If you wonder if you can truly be forgiven or not, you're not looking for a feeling. You're just looking for the truth of what the Lord actually said. If it says right there, whosoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life, that is truth. Truth you can hang on, truth you can bank on, truth you can say, yes, this is how it is. And as anyone else tries to steer you different, nope. Yeah, I may love you a lot, but I know what God said is true. And if what you say is different than what God says, no matter how much I love you, I got to go with what God says. Don't let anybody cheat you out of your birthright. Out of the privilege you have as a child of God. Sometimes we think that can't be right though because I'm not experiencing or I'm not doing or I'm not. And the simple fact is it doesn't matter what you think or feel. What matters is what God has said. And we lean on that. God has said, I and the Father are one. Look what God has said in verse 9. In Him, in Jesus, dwells, inhabits, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All the fullness of the deity. All that God is. Whatever it is that makes God God, dwells in the physical body of Jesus Christ. Jesus was there, as we've already seen in Colossians chapter 1, Jesus was there before creation. He is eternal. He was always the Son of God. He was there at creation, participating in it, holding the universe together. On that Christmas day in Bethlehem, Jesus, God the Son, came down to earth and took on mortal flesh, carnal flesh. But in living the sinless life, His flesh does not die. He is crucified on that cross and bodily he dies. On the third day, God the Father raises God the Son from the dead. And he is seen by many. All this time, all the fullness of God, of all that deity is, is dwelling in Christ. He now rises from the grave. He still has a body. Doubting Thomas gets to stick his fingers in the nail holes and the spear hole. Um, and, and on that day in the book of Acts, on the day right before Pentecost, Jesus ascends into heaven. They watched him. It wasn't like a ghost fading away. They watched him going up. And then angels appeared and said, the same way you saw him going up, he's going to come back, coming down. Stick with us, not this coming Sunday the 13th, but on the 20th of September. We'll be talking about that return, that moment of rapture uh, that we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 20. Come and join us that Sunday. Um, Jesus, all the fullness of the Godhead, dwells in Him bodily. He is not a ghost. He's not an idea. He's not something untangible. He is someone you could touch, you could hug, you could speak to. When John, the writer of the gospel and the writer of the book of Revelation, Revelation was a book he wrote about just what he saw in heaven as the Holy Spirit inspired him. And John saw Jesus and knew it was him. First seeing him as the ancient of days with white hair and shining like brass and he could not look upon him and fell at his feet as a dead man. That was in Revelation chapter 1. Then he sees Jesus again in Revelation chapter 4 and he describes him as he that sat on the throne was as a lamb that had been slain. He could see the scars. He could see the way Christ had been brutalized. That body glorified now but in a sense still able to see the price that was paid to get you and I into His presence. Jesus died bodily. His heart quit beating. He bled out on that cross. The Spirit left Him. Jesus even cried out and said, Fathers, into your hand I commend my spirit in His moment of death. It is finished, He cried out, and He gave up the ghost. 
Jesus died bodily and rose from the grave bodily. Once again, when he got with his disciples, he sat down and he ate with them. Why would he do that? Well, because he was hungry. Been three days since he'd had something. Jesus arose bodily, with a body, ascended into heaven with a body. In him dwells everything that God is in that body. He continues that because in him is all that fullness of God. And that's an important word, fullness. Again, everything that God is, Jesus is, dwelling in that body. Then he says, and he uses a word that's the same form as fullness. He used kind of a noun form of the word, plerao, um, there in verse 9, fullness. And then in verse 10, it says, you are, King James, New King James says, you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. You are complete. That also plays off that same root as plerao, um, and once again, you are full in Him. You are complete. You got everything you need in Jesus. Sometimes we use that phrase, Jesus is the answer. And then some smart aleck goes, well, what's the question? Then never mind, Jesus is the answer. What is it you're lacking in life? Do you feel a gap, a hole that's keeping you from being fulfilled? Keeping you from being happy? It's like, Really, everything you want in life is out there, but you just can't get it. And you know it's something inside of you that is messed up. That thing that's messed up is, is sin. And the only one who can care for that sin and get rid of it is Jesus Christ. And when you come to Him and say by faith, Lord, I trust that I know that what you did on that cross and dying for me you may not know the right words to say, but this is what you're trying to express. I know you died for me, Jesus. You took the punishment, the condemnation I deserved, and you rose from the grave to give that to me. In that moment, everything you're lacking, you now got. I am complete in Him. I may not always be happy. I may not always be joyful. I may have my good days, my bad days. I may struggle with depression, anxiety, all those things. Jesus can help with all that. But at the same time, what we want you to know is that you've got now everything you need. You are complete, fulfilled in Him. I used to use certain chemicals. When I was a teenager, to give myself some peace of mind, to give me some personal peace. I came to know Christ and I went about a year without doing anything like that. Then the opportunity presented itself one day when I was in California. Um, you know who you are. Um, and it was my senior year of high school. I got a whole year and the opportunity came and I imbibed. And it was interesting. While I was sitting there, inebriated, Suddenly realizing, whatever reasons I had for doing this are gone. I don't need it anymore. It doesn't do what it used to do for me. So that feeling of inebriation, that buzz, that getting high, whatever you want to call it, didn't mean anything to me anymore. It used to be the thing that held my life together, it felt like. Jesus Christ took away all that that did for me, and instead, He does it for me now. No, it's not a high, but whatever insecurity, whatever stress, whatever anxiety, He flushes that out. I don't need a drink at the end of the day to calm my nerves. I don't need a weed to help me feel better about myself or, or make my problems go away. With Jesus Christ, you get a peace that passes all understanding. You are complete in Him. The thing you think that that needle or that pill or that drug or that alcohol or whatever, that relationship, that pornography, whatever need you think it fills, Jesus fills that for us. Jesus fills that hole that you're trying to shovel something else into. You are complete. You are fulfilled. Why? Because everything a man could possibly have, Jesus has. In Him, all the fullness of God dwells in that body. And He comes and He gives that life to us. My life 
surrendered to Him. He pours His life into me. And suddenly, that gap, that emptiness, that thing I thought I was missing, I just found it. There's days I look out and I'm jealous at the world and what I could have, wish I could have and wish I could hang out with and all that. And when it all comes down, when the stresses really come and when the dark days come, I find out, man, Jesus is the only one there. Alcohol and drugs fail you. Relationships fail you. People fail you. Man, I, I look at your posts on Facebook and so many of you, man, I know who my true friends are and my true friends aren't. They're going to be there for me. I'm going to tell you, Jesus, I know, will always be there. He has not failed me yet. There's an old, I say it's an old song. It was new when I first heard it. Jesus never fails. You may as well get thee behind me, Satan. You will not prevail because Jesus never fails. That's true in my heart. I hope it's true in yours. You are complete in Him. Quit looking for it elsewhere. You say you believe in God and in your next post you got margaritas. You're talking about a party you went to. You're talking about how blasted you got. And that may be all good fun. I hope you didn't drive home that way. But do you really need that to feel at peace with yourself? Jesus gives us a peace, he says in John 14, a peace that the world doesn't have, a peace that passes all understanding. Your prayer life, you know, take it to him. Because in Philippians it tells us, in everything, with prayer and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which passes all understanding. What's it going to do? It's going to guard your heart. It's going to guard your mind in Christ Jesus. All that worrying, all that anxiety, all that pain you want to go away that you're trying to deaden. Jesus Christ, you are complete in Him. You will not need that anymore. This isn't a sermon against drinking or drugs. This is a message about the peace that Jesus gives is better than anything else you're going to find out there. And you as a Christian, don't tell me you haven't found it yet. You're like <coughs> that kid on Christmas Day. Looks like all the presents have been opened except one under the tree. You've opened all your presents and you're sitting there going, Man, isn't there anything else? Isn't there anything else? There's one more present under the tree, but it doesn't look like anything you've wanted up till now. It's not real big, it doesn't look like a car. You don't think it's got money in there. You leave that present aside and don't even care about it. But it turns out that's the one that was everything you'd ever want. That's the present Jesus comes in. We keep looking for another experience, another high, another party, another relationship. Something that's going to fill this empty spot. You know, a lot of couples think that having a baby is going to solve their marital problems. It's a lot of pressure to put on a child. You don't think of it that way, but... And I may, maybe it helps sometimes, but look. If you're not already right with the Lord, if you're not already happy with each other, don't expect that baby to make you happier. They got a way of creating stress. All on their own. More than you could imagine. You need to look for Jesus for finding what you need. Then you're ready for that baby. Then you're ready for marriage. Then you're ready to improve the marriage. Jesus Christ makes all this difference because of who He is. A relationship with Him. Let's pray for that. That that relationship would grow. That we would finally realize that everything we're looking for, we already got. We just didn't think He could do the job. Which really is what you're saying when you're looking for your peace anywhere else except in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we need to repent today. And by repent, we mean, we mean we need to change directions. We've been looking for other things to give us peace, to give us freedom from anxiety. We've been looking for other places to feel fulfilled, 
to feel loved. We've been looking for love in all the wrong places. It's all in you, isn't it, Jesus? You tell us right here, no matter what our state, single, married, divorced, addicted, free from addictions, broken, feeling on top of the world, whatever state we're in, we are complete only in you. Whatever we feel we're lacking, Jesus, what we're lacking is you. And Lord, help us to seek that in you. Help us to turn from our wicked way of trying to find things on earth that only heaven can satisfy. Trying to find things here and now to deaden the pain, to numb our anxiety. Trying to find things that are going to make us feel loved. And we find out, Lord, all those things come up so short. It's only in you, Jesus, do we find a relationship that lasts. In obeying you, we find freedom. In following you, we find direction. Lord God, today, bless who's ever listening. Reach out and touch them and help them to see everything they're looking for is in you. We are complete in you, Jesus. And I'm going to stop looking for it anywhere else. Only in you. And we say these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit through whom all this is possible. We say Amen. Well, I hope God blesses you as you seek Him. As you start to realize that He really is all you need. Today, give your heart to Christ. We will be having service on Sunday. Sunday school is at 9.30. Worship is at 10.45 here at Travis Baptist Church, 5802 Weber Road, Corpus Christi, Texas. We are across the street from the HEB on Weber and right next door to O'Reilly's, the big steeple. Can't miss us. Parking in the back. Come and see us this Sunday. I hope you have a good week and may God bless you as you seek Him.